Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> thanks, Marina. Um, well, thanks all of you for trying Access Praxis out. It's been really rewarding to have um, have it. Uh, appreciate so nicely by, by you guys. Can I just, just for my own, it's just a pure ego trip. Um, how many people here have used Access Praxis? Okay, cool. Thanks again. I, I'm, really, I'm really grateful and it's really, it really makes me happy. Um, so I'm just going to talk about the plan for the talk. I'm going to give a little bit of a background. Um, I usually put too much historical stuff in my presentations and don't get around to the what's new. So I'm going to try and make it snappy, but I want to, want to mention something. Then I'm going to talk about Access Practice itself, the one you know. Um, then I'm going to talk about the feedback that I had and um, fonts I have been sent that aren't live. Then I'm going to show you something, something you haven't seen before. And then I'm going to have an interlude talking about user interface, user interface stuff. And there's been several talks already. Um, about that, so that's, that's, uh, I hope to contribute to that debate. And then finally, if it works, fingers crossed, something else at the end. Uh, so let's get going with the background. And I made this very simple broad, stroke, broad brush strokes timeline of 50 years, 1970 on the left, 2020 on the right. Um, so you can see if we go backwards from Today, 2017, OpenType 1.8 is launched uh, towards the end of 2016. Then, so what I'm pointing, putting above the line are things that interpolate fonts. This is, they understand variable fonts, essentially. Things below the line are what was going on in, in IT and in other aspects of typography that may be influenced above the line. Um, so if we go back, we see glyphs and robot font coming out in 2011. Superpolator, I think the first one was in 2004. Uh, Fontforge was kind of uh, multiple master aware in, uh, well, it kind of started in 2001. Fontlab Studio back in 92, I think. And then Fontographer, not sure when the first one that was handled multiple masters, but you know, late 80s, let's say. And in technology terms, we go back to GX in 1994, 95, the launch. Um, multiple masters and TrueType itself. Uh, were 1991, and I put true type there because of the hinting language, which is able to treat outlines as a, a pretty amazing structure uh, and do, do cool interpolating things with them. Uh, we go m back much further to Metafont in 1979, the first version of Metafont, and we go back to 1973 for Icarus. Um, so people have been looking at this stuff for a, a, hell, of a long, hell of a long time. Um, and I want to start just to mention a little anecdote or little story about the about Icarus. So I, I emailed Peter Karov uh, before this talk, and he just summarised what Icarus interpolation did already in 1973. He says, "Now I'm not sure if it actually shipped in 1973, but the concept was there, and this is the well-known interpolation equation down there at the bottom. You need a set of compatible points, and you." move your x between x1 and x2 according to a parametric a parameter f. Um, everyone uh, knows a bit of maths can see what's going, going there. Uh, he sent me this email with some things that were going on. It was run on an IBM mini computer. CPU costs 350 Deutschmarks per hour. 32 kilobytes of storage. Um, oh, that's on a, that's, uh, so that's the memory, 500k you could actually store. Only 16k for your program. Um, so, and then I asked him how long did interpolation take? Um, so that's five hours operating time, so that's to get this program ready, to program it all. Um, let's, oh, it could punch, so input and output was with punch tapes. You got your output at 30 bytes per second on these punch tapes. Um, yeah, the CPU time for interpolating characters was 15 minutes per 100 characters. That's nine seconds per glyph. To interpolate, uh, so we pr have it pretty good. Um, so they bought their own computer, end of '73. Um, they were massive amounts of money, and th the idea of programming these things was was uh, not easy. Um, 
coming forward a bit, what, what was the state in 1994? It was really, really exciting. There was all this. Metafont was already 15 years old. Multiple Master was three years old. Photographer had been, was mature. TrueType was mature and very well received. TrueType GX had just been launched, and people were getting very excited about it. Font Chameleon, another amazing product. Elsewhere, Infinifont. Um, a development of Panos into a full parametric system. I wrote a blog post about this. It's a fascinating project. Um, so what happened in 1994? Well, if we go back to this slide, I put a little devil um, emoji on what I think is probably to blame. Uh, and it's the web. And I, I think the web is to blame because it, 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 stopped, it, it stopped the excitement, but it was for good reasons. It, 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 realized, it, it made people realize that there's a lot of stuff in text handling that we've got to sort out before we go on with this craziness. We've got to sort out character encoding, Unicode and so on. We've got to sort out content management. We've um, got to sort out type on low resolution devices. There's a lot of stuff that uh, ha had to be sorted out and it affected very large industries. The newspaper industry slowly started going online. Advertising industry, how do they react? They weren't interested in tiny little details of, of serifs and you know, the, 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 the very fine stuff you could do with, with, with GX. It was much more basic. And so a lot of stuff was just put on hold. That's what I'd be interested to hear what other people think, why, why it petered out, but that's what I, uh, I think if you, in a broad brushstroke, that's what I think kind of happened. Um, what happened in between? Of course, there was, there was lots of work going on. In, in, the, in the background, you see the, the applications, the, the, the Fontographer, the Font Studio, the Font Forge, Superpolator. They were very happily making fonts at the back end, but they weren't delivering anything resembling a variable, a variable parametric font. Um, there were some attempts to revive it. So let's um, see what happened in 2004. Adam mentioned this event in his uh, talk. This is George Williams, the author of Font Forge, writing to the free type list in 2004 uh, that he has implemented the GVAR, FVAR tables inside Mel Mac Multiple Master, uh, sorry, inside GX. Would the free type people be interested? Because he, he was putting it in Font Forge already. Um, I don't know how much of it went into free type then. I think some of it did. Um, if we come forward a bit to something that Adam himself contributed to the, which mailing list was this to? Public web fonts, yeah, the web fonts working group mailing list. Um, Adam says, in the web context, I think at least one of these variable font models deserves resurrection because it offers tremendous compression p potentials, lends itself well into the responsive web paradigm, offers new possibilities for text layout on the web, and above all, can be implemented much more easily on the web than it ever could be on desktop platforms. Plus, the specs are already there. Apple had the specs online all the time. Um, prophetic, but he didn't get any, any, any replies to this. This is only four years ago. Amazing. Uh, then to 2015, two blog posts, only three days apart, by Andrew Johnson and Nick Sherman, beautifully typeset, and they, they did get quite a few, reti uh, quite a few ret retweets and, and, and social media uh, coverage about this is all from the responsive web angle. Uh, they're both worth a read. Um, so we're here now, uh, OT 1.8, and getting much closer. This is, only, this is a, a less than a year ago uh, in, in the city. This is Bedard talking about a, a new CSS uh, structure that could be really useful for variable fonts. And he personally had been uh, making a, debugging the free type code that George Williams had contributed back in 2004 and getting it to work. And you can, it's fascinating to watch the, read the bug reports about, yeah, now we finally made the lizard walk in Zycon. Um, uh, and the, 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 the tail of the queue in Skier, yeah, it now works. It, it's, uh, it's cool to read. Anyway, variable font day, September 14th, 2016. In, uh, in Warsaw, uh, pretty momentous day. Uh, Georg reminded me that he shipped GX export support the same day. Amazing, well done, well done Georg, for that, wonderful. Um, it was just about possible to make these things, but not for mortals. Um, there it is. Uh, of course, the first version had a few bugs, but I went, uh, we don't need to mention those. Um, so everyone went away from Warsaw, I want to play with these things. I can make them in glyphs. Um, where do I? Where can I? Where can I use them? Uh, still nowhere. Jesus, I'm I'm going crazy, man. <laughs> What's going on? Nowhere. And then 
great relief. Uh, Miles Maxfield, the uh, lead text developer on Safari, posted this on his blog, which is um, his, it, the first publicly available downloadable version of Safari um, in its WebKit nightly incarnation, which did this. And it was wonderful. We realized things were possible. It used this, um, this CSS, a new piece of CSS, um, just like you add font family in your CSS, font uh, color, background color, normal text kind of stuff, font variation settings. You set positions on the axis. All the ingredients were now in place to make a playground on the web. Um, isn't anyone else doing it? I thought, well, I better do it. So a month later, I launched this thing. Um, that's a video online that I posted the same day, and I got a wonderful yeah, reception to it. I thought of it as a simple tool for font developers. I deliberately didn't go wild on the, the look and feel. I deliberately wanted a 1990s look, and I'm glad that uh, Dan Rattigan, at least, <laughs> uh, likes that aspect of it. Um, not everyone did, but, and said it detracts uh, from uh, the beauty. But I, I, I wanted to show that it was just a single element to web typography. It wasn't part of, it wasn't an intrinsic part of responsive web design. It was just a new aspect of CSS. You do it, and the web designers, front end developers, do with it what you will. Um, so I use, this is a few decisions I made. I, just, I can start on the Mac with Skia, which has been in the Mac OS since 1994. Uh, San Francisco, three, um, th three cuts of the, their new system-wide uh, font, which were variable, which I didn't know actually were variable until I just explo started exploring the system. I found these three TTFs. Oh, they're variable, it's wonderful. Um, so I exposed those in the browser and just put simple sliders up. Uh, just wrote some JavaScript to a uh, to, to capture the user events, a bit of PHP on the server, deliberately simple 90s style UI, deliberately no font size adjustment because that adds an extra slide. I didn't want to overwhelm people. Um, didn't add any responsive frameworks or anything. I just relied on jQuery. That's the only thing I, I, I like to use for making my code, you know, writing JavaScript a bit more easily. Uh, so you could play with Skia and three words of San Francisco. And I thought it was very important from day one to add to have a drag and drop feature. So fonts that were in development and weren't ready to be published, you could drag them on to Access Praxis. Um, I wasn't quite ready with the in-browser version at the time. So initially, it was uploading them to the server. Then it would do some processing in TTX and give me the processed name table and FR table to play with on the, in the browser. But within a couple of weeks, I'd done the uh, the JavaScript one, so it was no longer uploading your font to my server, and that made a lot of people happy, so that I, I wasn't collecting all the variable fonts, <laughs> which was tempting, but um, I, I never did it, I promise. Um, so you could see all the axes and instances inside, inside the font. Um, so, yeah, so I've covered that about TTX. Uh, so it's, and it's much quicker, that's the other thing about doing it all in the browser. It's more or less instant dragging, dragging the font. So I'll just uh, run through a, a few... Uh, aspects of it that um, you, you know well. Uh, that's the initial screen. I decided to not use the uh, drop-down list of instances, but just to display them straight away so they'd be very clear, just after the initial drag, what the instances were. Um, and you can s switch this text to, uh, there we are. And then this list of fonts down on the left, that's now 23 in total, which I'm is very, is, is, is very nice to see. It started off at none at all, but then people started offering me their fonts, and I started seeing free uh, Libra fonts posted on GitHub and so on. Um, so that's been really, really great, having all these people um, letting me host their fonts. And these aren't all uh, free fonts or Libra fonts. So Zeitung is a commercial font, uh, Dunbar as well. So these are um, commercial type founders who never intend to release these fonts for free, but they're happy to let people play with them at this time on, on Access Praxis, which is, not, is great. Um, what am I going to show you here? Let's go back to the... Oh, um, I added a reset button as well, because there are some... Let's install these. Um, so, yeah, some fonts have a rather crazy number of axes. So, it's sort of... What the hell do we do? We've got a bit confused. We can just do the reset button to, to regain our sanity. Um, and what shall I, shall I show you on the main access practice? Oh, I launched a blog uh, later in November. 
that's the latest blog post. Uh, I'll update that after the conference with updates on how um, the latest, how the browsers are all progressing. Um, Safari, Chrome, and Firefox, you can try all those out on the Mac. Chrome and Firefox need a few configuration settings, but they're pretty cool. Chrome is, has some, is, is one step ahead in, in a certain respect, which is in, interesting. Um, then I, this is um, a photograph of a, um, a plaque in uh, the city of Reims in, in France, where there's a historic motor racing circuit. Uh, the cars no longer race there, but there are a few pieces of evidence around the circuit in public buildings. Um, so this is essentially hand lettering. It's, it's um, hand carved on, on stone, I believe. Um, what you can see happening in this list of uh, drivers here and car makers here, um, the, the, the type is, is stretching to fit the box available. The box is a consistent size all the way up. And the, the letterer has, has adapted the, the type all the way up. This is extremely difficult to do with digital type. Um, and it's been one of the, yeah, that was one of the things that people were buzzing with after open, uh, variable font day. Oh, here we can sort of fit stuff to width and stuff. And I thought, well, it's actually a bit more tricky than you think. Um, so uh, Chris Lewis and Nick Sherman also explored this in uh, uh, a JavaScript little plugin you could um, put into your website. This would choose the most appropriate font if you have a series of width related fonts. Um, I thought I would implement a width control, a fit to width control. So here it is. This is public. It's been, this went live in November as well. This is just a simple string of text that's finding the most appropriate weight of skier to use as I resize this text box. Notice the color of the handles. Green indicates all is well. If I stretch it too far, though, it's gone blue. Now, that means that it's gone beyond the axis of uh, the width axis. Um, it can't, can no longer handle it, so it's using a simple scale in, in the x direction. Um, again, we've gone beyond here. One nice thing, um, though, is you can, uh, you can, you, you see, we've got rid of a slider, which is interesting. Jean Baptiste will thank me. There's only one slider on this font anymore because we're controlling the width by our size of our text box. So we've got rid of a slider, and I think that's a, one of these things we'll be need to think about a lot when we. Um, build interfaces for these things. Watch what's happening as well when I adjust weight. The width is adjusting to let the weight happen. So there's a, some CSS being shown on the left there. You probably can't read it. Um, but you see, it's, as I move the width, it's green, the green zone now. As I move it to the right, it's gone red. The, that text box can no longer handle a font of that weight. So I'd have to move it out there before it can handle it. Um, what it's doing behind the scenes is it, it, you, you can't calculate this analytically. You have to do lots of iter iterations. So it, I found 15 was a very good number. You do a binary search to hone down onto the, the, the width setting that works. There's more you could do in a real app. You could adjust tracking and, and word spacing and so on. Um, and this would work in conjunction with justification settings and, and this kind of thing. But this is simply width axis and a scale when it, when it goes wrong. Uh, let's go back to the... There. That's a blog post explaining how it works. Um, so yeah, after all that happened, thanks very much for all the feedback. And a large number of it, a, a large amount of it, was criticism for the look and feel, and people very eager to have a font size slider. So I took that all into consideration. Thanks for all the fonts as well. So I just want to show you a couple of fonts that I was uh, sent over the months. Let's. Uh, Get up. Yeah. Uh, Beowulf Turbo is pretty cool. So uh, I'm going to slide the craziness axis here. And then this axis just wobbles that craziness around. So if we just have a little craziness there, and then this sort of is a cycle, this top axis. It's a really neat use of the technology, I think. Uh, Several more. I got uh, Lucas's uh, Move Me guy working. That was just by downloading his public mul <laughs> his public um, multi uh, multiple master. Uh, David Jonathan Ross sent me a version of his uh, Gimlet, which is a wonderful new typeface with a lot of uh, 
a lot of vertical verticality in it, so it's pretty useful for a very extreme width axis. So check that out. It's not, uh, he doesn't want it live on access practice just yet. Um, he's yet to make up his mind about um, how the variable wants to be sold. But thanks all for those who've donated fonts publicly and uh, for the people who've let me play with their fonts in development. I, I really want to, can't thank them enough. It's been wonderful. Uh, companies large and individuals, everything. Now I want to show you the first something, um, which is this. Access practice two, beta. So I'll, uh, it's there now. You can go to it right now, if you like, and follow along uh, on a variable browser, of course. Uh, and is it demo next? Oh, uh, sorry. A tool for foundries. There you are. Um, so if you regard the first one as a tool, how I thought saw it, a tool for font developers, this is a tool more for foundries, um, how they might work with variable fonts. So. Oops, I've uh, blown my cover. There we are. So that's the default screen. Um, doesn't look that much different from Access for Access 1, um, except it's just a little bit more attractive. Um, it's got a list of what seem like to be fonts down the left-hand side. They're actually, they're actually specimens. They're saved specimens. I'll show you how that works. We can edit, edit this stuff just like we could in Access Praxis 1. Uh, choose. Now I have gone to a, um, a font uh, instance chooser of the normal type. Um, we can also add color. We can also change font size. We can also change line height. Uh, all the fonts that were in Access Praxis 1 are now installed by default. There's no separate install button. Um, and it just feels a lot, it's, once, it's well, several steps closer to, to, to knowing how a, a real design app would work, would, would feel in, in, variable, in variable. There's some you know, text alignment stuff as well. Um, you can also add text boxes. So here's text boxes. This is adds the, the ID and the DOM. So typo labs ID. We've got a new text box down there. So I'm going to change the Font to Voto, bring the size up, and uh, so here we are. So we've got a um, a specimen up. Let's uh, make sure it looks a bit different from how it did look. Now uh, let's say I want to share that specimen with um, some colleagues. How do I do it? Well, it's currently in, in Access Practice 1, you just take screenshots, I guess, or get someone to screen share while you do some stuff. I thought that I needed to improve that quite drastically. So I've got a share icon up here. Um, you can click that and say I'll do typo labs spec. Right, let's do that resized. Uh, so it's come in the left-hand column there as typo lab spec. I've saved that. Let's check out what the URL is. Now that URL is public. It's not guessable because it's got a, encrypt, a weird encrypted, a uh, weird coded URL. So I'm just going to prove to you that that's public. Uh, so. So yeah, I've now shared that specimen with anyone who wants to, to see it. That's, uh, so that's cool. Um, I have to show you a few more things. The sliders work as before. This, you can now type in actual numbers here. You, you see the actual weight settings. So if I want weight one, sorry, there we one, we can do it. We can, we've got the full reset button at the top there, that tiny little arrow there. We've got individual resets on each axis as well. Um, I'll go through some of these other specimens now. So here's a specimen. I made nearly all of these specimens uh, with a little bit of help. Um, they're much more appropriate for each typeface. So this is what a specimen is. It doesn't go to the same template for every typeface. That's crazy. Um, so I like the idea of offering this to foundries. You can 
make a new specimen for Voto Serif if you've made it. So that's what I did for Zeitung. I said, uh, hey, underwear guys, your specimen I've made is deliberately ultra simple. And uh, so they came back, with, I think in less than 24 hours, with, with this, a nice, nicely designed new specimen. As with the others, it's editable, and people can take that further, or they can, so they can work out an update. Um, yeah, this kind of stuff. Um, you can also, there's also, I thought there was a need for, to find out information about these fonts. So let's have a look at uh, Amstel VAR information. Ah, oh, it's uh, come out with its the file name, the file size, some errors it's found in the font. In the FR table, the axes are lowercase when they should be uppercase. Now, I told David Burlow I found these errors, and he said, you haven't updated the latest version. It has, doesn't have any of these errors. Um, but it does still have the stat table. The use of version one table is uh, deprecated, uh, David. You should know this. Um, um, it's got some links to the GitHub page and a type network page about uh, Amstel VAR. It lists all the axes there. The, um, the, uh, it underlines the registered axes. There are their minimum, default, and, uh, and maximums there. And lists some stuff from the name table. I'm not sure how to go, how far to go with this. This is, you know, in principle, could go, show you the whole font in TTX style, but didn't want to. Do, obviously, don't want to do that. And the errors it's showing are only those that are relevant to making variable fonts, uh, as opposed to other fonts. Um, the CSS button is pretty cool. So, if we have the CSS button active, anything we do with this is reflected in the, the CSS the font size as well and the color as well. Um, I should put a, a save on button on that so you can actually edit the CSS up there. That's risky, of course, with all sorts of stuff that repositioned the, the, uh, the divs, but uh, uh, I think it would be, be handy to have, especially if you're wanting to make more fancy specimens. Uh, the new text box I've talked about. Oh, there's a print button, so that's uh, in there. So it's uh, ready to print now. It's taken off the sidebars and the, the heading, so you can print out your specimens. Uh, showing you about the saving. I haven't shown you that uh, that little magnifier. I'm really uh, annoyed, actually. The, the the cool thing here that people were using to highlight bits of the screen is is broken. Um, but no matter. I've uh, implemented it in Axis Praxis here. It's actually uh, a magnifier as well, though. Uh, so we can inspect what's going on. And Amstelvar is doing some really weird stuff. I don't think these are bugs. These are just deliberately exploring ways to, to make this stuff. So I'll, I can go, go here and just see what's happening in a really detailed level. Well, there's uh, something weird happening with that overlap. So I'm going to just zoom out right in. Uh, OK. Wow, cool stuff. OK, um, uh, and we can just, let's uh, zoom back out again. Uh, and there. And this has been really useful for checking out details in, uh, I remember that someone else pointed, rem reminded me these are, called, these are called cookies in Buffalo VAR. So let's see what shape they are. And yeah, the magnifier is so powerful, it can you know, zoom into text sizes as well. So it's pretty cool. Let's see what the concavity is doing. There we are. Bracketing. All oh, right, that's doing the bracketing like that. Toggle cookies. Oh, it's a little sort of window blind on them. Uh, you know, this stuff you don't notice it with um, unless you. Uh, and I love interfaces that don't change the context. This, this keeps the context of the document, and it's uh, a loop. They, they had they implemented this in Aperture, really great, the really great photo editing app. Um, I haven't seen it done on, uh, on, on in the browser though, so that was. Uh, but play with that. Let me know if it breaks. Uh, it breaks every now and then. Um, it is beta. There are still lots of bugs. And uh, what else do I want to show you? I, uh, let's go back to the presentation, see what that's going to come up with. So text styling is much more like a real design app. Uh, we can tweak the axis values much more, much more easily. We can um, type in actual values. 
One thing I want to add to the tweaking, though, is a nudge button. I think that'd be really, really useful if you could nudge the axis value up just by the smallest possible value. So if these are 16.16 .16 floating point values, sorry to get a bit technical, if you could add just one unit to that, then see what would happen. That would be really useful to de for debugging very complex, um, complex uh, uh, variable fonts. Um, in fact, I'll just show you one extremely cool font that some people don't seem to be aware of. Uh, how many people have seen Selawick variations? Yeah, uh, this, oops, let's uh, highlight that text box. What's going on here is quite remarkable behind the scenes. And it's, you see, I'm just changing an axis, the weight axis, and most of and the letters A, X, I, S, and 1 are moving, as you'd expect. The rest is going crazy, though. It's, it's actually a, a default ligature that has been set up. This is Microsoft uh, font, by the way, and um, it's uh, based on a Selawick uh, by Aaron Bell. Greg Hitchcock did the, uh, this remarkable hinting. And it's, so as I type the, the letter S, uh, is that it? No, oh, axis one, there we are. Um, it shows me the value deep inside the variable font. So this is not the value you see exposed. It's not the value from weight 1 to weight 999 or whatever. This is the value once that's been transformed into deep internal inside the rasterizer, which is goes from the value of minus 1, default of 0, to plus 1. This is what we're looking at here. There are other codes you can do to expose the version of the rasterizer. You can see this number in hex. So you can actually see just with incrementing it by 1 what happens inside this font. You, so you can watch one glyph alongside this digital readout. It's, uh, uh, I had no idea this was possible. It was um, wonderful stuff. And it opens the door to a lot of very interesting things, I think. Uh, let me go back there. So we have the loop uh, magnifier I showed you. Oh, we have axis uh, interaction. I just want to show you one thing there, which is the uh, in the settings box. Sorry, awful uh, layout there. I didn't have time to fix that. Um, so we've got a default there, a link with font size. So um, the idea is that any font with an optical size, let's try Voto Serif, we can, uh, as the font size goes down, watch what happens with the optical size axis. Can you see? So they're programmed by default for the, if there's no PZSZ axis in the font, for font size to look it up and adjust it accordingly. Now, it's difficult to know how much of this will be necessary in the, uh, this is JavaScript doing this. Uh, Safari has already, or WebKit, the WebKit branch of Safari has already implemented automatic optical size. Um, I think you need to get involved in that discussion to see if they're implement, implementing it in the right way. I'm, um, it's very early days. Um, but yeah, in development versions of Safari, you, as you increase the font size, simply that's all you need to do, and it will choose a different optical size if it's in the font. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, the other axis interaction that I mentioned, I already showed you in um, the fit to width demo. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't, uh, sorry, going back to the slide. This, uh, you can adjust the size of your text boxes, but unfortunately, I, d I meant to have a fit to width checkbox. I haven't quite got that working, so that'll be uh, a little delayed. Um, but yeah, the idea of as you move other stuff, we can interact width and weight, as you saw with, with Skia. Uh, font error reporting, as I showed you, uh, every font that you drag and drop, all that's built into Axis Praxis, it will give you these errors. And if there are any other errors you know about that you'd like me to track, you tell me how to detect them, and I'll, I'll add them. Uh, saving and sharing specimens uh, that you create. Let me know if, there's, if you're responsible for one of these uh, fonts I have as default. Um, and I'll update the default specimen. It's not yet, I haven't yet worked out a policy of how to, uh, what happens if it's a drag and drop font? What happens if you save that specimen? That involves digital rights. I don't, people don't necessarily want their font to go up to my server, even if it's only available to people using that specific URL, which isn't exposed publicly. So I, I, there's some policy issues there, as well as, um, yeah, I haven't actually implemented the uploading, but it, that's, a non that's, that's a trivial aspect. Um, I also want to make it better for non-variable visitors. So um, 
the idea that someone comes to the browser and gets a warning, you need a, you need a variable thing. That's a bit off-putting. So I think we need to, you know, I, I need to show them a video of how how this font how how this font would look if only you had um, a variable browser. So uh, yeah, specimens is a the big the, the, I think the biggest deal uh, about AP2. Uh, Oh, this is what happens if you're making notes for a presentation and you have one of the true type developers in your address book, which was um, I found quite amusing. Um, this, is, this is a list of the errors it detects. Uh, so if the tuple is out of range, if uh, the weight axis isn't according to the spec, there are quite a lot of fonts that fail on that second one. Uh, stat table not present, stat table wrong, uh, the old version that wasn't so well defined. Uh, a, few, a few other things. As, as I say, if there's anything that you find in uh, some tools are creating bad fonts, I can, I can add these, these checks. Um, I want to have a little interlude now about user interface. Um, so put that aside now. What do we do about user interface for all, the, all this stuff? As John Hudson says, there's no practical limit. It's 64,000. Uh, 64,000. And Jean-Baptiste Levet was made some very good points I thought about uh, stylistic sets, those tiny numbers. Peter Sicking back in November was uh, push, putting up all you know, terrible interfaces like this. Uh, Bob Taylor just in February was talking about the two paradigms of either, what are we thinking of, either sliders or picking from, um, picking from a drop down. Um, this is what Jean Baptiste was reputed to have said uh, during my presentation in Nancy. I presented the uh, Access Practice version one at the Automatic Type Design Conference. Um, so he, he went a bit further than he went in his uh, talk. Um, but there will be sliders. Uh, of that, there's no doubt. Um, but we're, we're trying, you know, one by one. Let's, let's get rid of them. And uh, I've, I've shown a couple of examples. With the, you know, the op Once you automate optical size, for example, the obvious thing to do is get rid of it in, in the UI. Um, so here's an, uh, let's look at some options for re removing sliders. Uh, remo removing sliders. <laughs> uh, dials. Underwear has done that. I think most of you have seen the Taitung demo. So that's the question: Is that a better, or it's just it's nice to see a different interface? Switches. We haven't I haven't heard much talk about switches, but I think they're pretty important. If you look at Decovar, a lot of the interesting stuff happens uh, in a very binary ma manner. It's here, here it's on, here it's off. So this is what, an axis at zero, here it is at 1,000. I don't know how much Font Bureau David cares about what's going on in between these, the, these extremes. And yeah, maybe you can use the AVAR table to mean that these, the in-betweens don't actually exist. You can't actually access them. So, and the great thing about implementing it all in standard GVAR rather than switching to uh, GSUB and uh, feature variations, is that you retain the, si the compression advantages of, of, um, of, of, of GX. If you, if you start f substituting glyphs, you lose all the compression. So even if font goes from regular to bold, you're still, and you, or regular to italic, sorry, yeah, re let's say regular to bold, and the in-betweens are useless, they're not actually worth having, it's still a much smaller font than the, the two individual ones, or the feature variation version of that font would have been. So still consider it. Um, if you have control over the, the, the pipeline, uh, let's say you're in control of a web server, why not? If, if your users can't choose those in-betweens. Um, so yeah, I've just uh, said that. So don't assume that a feature variation is the way if you want a binary um, switch in your variable font. Fit to width is another way of removing a slider. I showed you the example. Uh, and video player controls. You know, this kind of font, does, this kind of glyph doesn't need a slider. It needs a play and a pause button. Uh, let's see, uh, multi, so two axes at once. How do we handle this kind of thing? Well, we have these very nice uh, mo traditional models to, to go by. Here's Univer 50, 1957, you all know that. Three-dimensional model. Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't remember the exact date for that the Nord's Eye Cube. Uh, this is Type Shift by Andrew Johnson, a uh, current project. You see in the right-hand corner there, he's, is this a video? Sorry, it's not a video. Um, there's an interface where you can drag your, your pointer along weight and width in two axes and, and choose fonts in one, one, one swoop. Try it out, and I don't, I, again, these are very early attempts, 
don't know how, people, how much people will, will like them. Basically, we're just providing numbers to devices. How do we provide numbers to devices in the real world? Here's one way. Here's another, effectively. And we're using this, this big thing we're grabbing onto. We're moving it one way and the other. There are a few switches on the dash. Uh, there's some pedals we operate with our feet. These are providing numbers to devices. Again, providing numbers to devices. The me is the uh, photographer, not the uh, engine driver. We're providing numbers to devices. What's the best interface? Are people trying these physical ideas in type design? Uh, this is Andy Clymer back in 2007. Hooked up uh, some fancy facial recognition stuff. Here he is uh, just a couple of years ago in The Hague. Um, everyone looks very happy. It's about that gadget on the, the right there, which is an Arduino-powered uh, device, if you know those little chips for experimenters. Um, so there's no sound. Um, but everyone's getting extremely happy, just as a glyph getting bigger and smaller. It's not even uh, interpolating. But um. <laughs> uh, This is Lila Simon's uh, workplace at Hallmark Cards. This is her normal desk. Uh, there's one piece missing from when she does kerning, which is a uh, game controller. And she does that. That's her regular workflow. Uh, this is not this is not an interpolation, but it's just using unusual stuff in hardware, in, in, in type design. This is Toshi at Monotype. Again, that's his preferred way of, of, of kerning. The only reason he doesn't do it more, apparently, is because the clicking of the game controller annoys his colleagues. <laughs> um, this is Baptiste Guénon, uh, who designed some, uh, who built a lovely website that look, uses the camera to uh, adjust both font size and optical size. Is, he, is Baptiste here? No, I thought it was going to be. OK. Uh, Jake Giltsoff, again, he's, um, he has actually hooked it up to, a, um, to width there. Oh, weight and width, yeah. Uh, and there's my dear old Axis Crisis dial that I demoed um, um, some time ago. I'll just uh, show you how that works back in Access Praxis 1. So we're, whoops, sorry, that's not very good. Uh, you didn't see that. Uh, so it's a simple device. I'm marketing it for a simple, very limited edition price of $500 a, a, a pop, <laughs> inspired by Microsoft Surface Dial, of course. You just put it on the screen. No, you don't, you don't put it on the screen. Um, <laughs> but you, you just do this. It feels really great. Uh, you give it one click to adjust the other axis. That's, we're now on the width. Where, let's go to optical size. And then there's double click to, to go to um, the different text boxes. It feels really fantastic. So if you'd like to have a go with that. Oh, you also, if you push and, and turn it, it does it really finely, does really small adjustments. Feels great. Oh, that's actually a, a Griffin PowerMate from 2003. Still works. Beautiful thing. Uh, oops. Uh, so the UI in Axis Praxis. So I'm I'm not sure how far to go with this. It's uh, you know this is what I've done so far. There's instant selection, which I didn't have before, with uh, drop down. We've got sliders, numeric entry. The nudge up and down is coming. Uh, that, so I didn't finish that. What I was saying about that. The nudge up and down will be in the 16.16 .16 space and the 2.14 space. They're both important things to consider. Uh, syncing op size to font size, and the Axis Praxis dial. Oh. One more thing, the axis table. Um, I'm a bit wary of presenting, uh, of proposing tables. Um, and it's extremely early uh, idea for a table. But uh, just imagine if this, and, and by the way, first drafts of tables, I think, should be in JSON. It's a brilliant little way of uh, saving. It does, it's not very efficient in space, but you know, who cares when you're developing a format? So this, would, this talks about, this proposes um, a dial for the weight axis in the font a 2D axis for width and weight, a switch for the serif axis with off at zero, on at one, a 3D axis, maybe a Nord's I, for a Nord's IQ UI with axis width, weight, and contrast, and then finally an animation type with it acts, acts on the M1 axis, begins at zero, ends at 1,000, repeats true, so it's supposed to cycle around, and its duration of two seconds. 
that could be useful for the, uh, the Zycon cyclist or something like this. Um, the idea is that you put this information in the font, and this is the preferred, the way the font suggests you interact with it. That's my idea for this table. I don't know if it's crazy, but um, just tell me what you think. Um, something else now. I hope there's time. Uh, yeah, should be. Uh, so I'm going to go to, where shall I go first? Right. Right, this is a really old style user interface. You know, I haven't pretty far, pretty it up, pretty it up at all. Whoops, let's uh, get rid of the Twitter. So it says drop var font here. So I'm going to do that with uh, Gingham. It's one of the very first variable fonts out the door, made with glyphs, and it's been a wonderful testing font. It's very simple, doesn't do anything funny. It's got 60 glyphs in, so it's really nice for testing. So what does that do? Oh, it's brought up the axes, weight and width that are inside the font, and it's printed the word variable twice. OK, so what happens when we move this? We get some it changes, I'd always expect. The top one's a bit flickery, though. It's got some debug output at the bottom. Um, so I'm going to go back to my presentation now, but bear that in mind. Um, consider where are instances born? Um, and for hundreds of years, OK, maybe 40 years, they were born in your font editor. You had this clever font editor, whether it was Icarus or Glyphs or FontLab, and you generated your instances in the font editor. Then they made their, in a web font setup, they made their way to the web font server, then to the browser. And then the browser used some simple operating system services to render the font. Um, but in principle, you could, the web font server itself could be where instances are born. You could send um, two UFOs to the web font server, and that could maybe using a font make tool chain or font lab on the server or something. Uh, you conceive lots of um, ways of doing it. That, that the server itself is sending out these instances that are requested by a client. It could happen in the browser. Now, this is, so this is what's happening in Chrome, for example. Uh, Chrome, is, uh, Chrome will have to um, operate on all platforms, so it has no option. It can't rely on operating systems that Safari can. Safari can rely for the Mac services, the Cortex services, to do, to do the font. That's when the variable font turns into instances there. If it turns into instances here, which is the case for Chrome and Firefox, it all happens in the browser. So consider those, those four places where instances are born. Um, and now consider another program I wrote back in the, uh, did I? Where is that? Let me. Sorry, let's. Sorry. It's right, this is a program I wrote back in 2013, uh, around when Adam was writing that proposal to the Web Fonts Working Group. Uh, and I, I got, it, got it working. I thought it was pretty cool. And I, what, it, what it's doing behind the scenes is it's loading um, a font from my server and displaying it. N nothing amazing there, except that it's doing it. It's not doing it as not by normal font face methods. It's doing it by um, XML HTTP requests. So it's bringing it into the browser. It's then parsing lots of stuff inside the font, including the glyph table, and turning it into SVG. So let's see what happens if we click a letter. Um, right, okay, we're seeing all the points in there, and we can uh, start to move them around. Okay, it's got a save button, so actually let's, um, sorry, let me do this in Chrome, sorry about that. Here it is, right, it was already loaded in Chrome. Um, okay, I'm messing up with the A, okay. I'm going to save that, and this TTF icon has appeared on the desktop. I'm going to click that. Um, something's landed in my downloads folder, so I'm going to see what it is. Uh, it seems to be a TTF file, so let's delete those. They're not, not to be seen. Uh, so it's a new TTF has just been made by my browser. Um, you see the funky A at the top there. Um, and I was amazed how fast it all worked. I mean, I'd seen, I don't know how many people saw Linux in 
made done in JavaScript, that wowed me. And I guess it was shouldn't have come as a surprise, but it did how fast it was. So going back to my talk, back to the same demo. Okay, out again. Uh, so we've seen it working in in uh, Safari Tech Preview. I'm just going to get it run it in normal Safari. Let's uh, again grab Gingham there. Um, you see the it's actually working in normal Safari, which is and the other one, the the lower one isn't, and the lower one isn't because that's being that's a normal variable font. It, I'm just my JavaScript is just throwing font variation settings at the lower box. It's actually making a new instance um, many, many times a second um, in the top version, which is pretty cool. So that's all happening in JavaScript. What can we do with that? Um, well, this it turns out that this string at the bottom here isn't just debug output. It's um, it's uh, something else. So how many people have uh, heard of this? Node. OK, well, that node is a way of taking some JavaScript that's working nicely in your browser and running it on your server instead. It means you can maintain only one set of code for your, your stuff that's happening on the server, stuff that's happening in the browser. So I'm going to log into my server in California. Uh, Right, so I'm going to start something called apfontserver.js. Right, that's running. And so I've, I'm setting up a, a brand new web server on my web server. It already has Apache running that's, sen that's sending out my website. I've now set up a new web server. It's responding to a different port. Now, normal web servers respond to port 80. This one's responding to a different port. So it won't receive any of the normal uh, web website requests that I that Access Practice 2 and Access Practice 1 requests. It's completely separated. It's getting requests on port 8080. And how you add a port to a URL is to a colon and then that number. So what I'm going to do is, in Chrome again, because it's a little bit better with the naming of downloaded files, is um, Praxis org. Now uh, serve font, whoops, let's have a query there, and whoops, sorry about that, what's gone wrong there, sorry, yes you're right, I didn't put the, the um, port, 80, 80. Right, I've got another download. Uh, is that going to work? It says Kingdom Undefined. Oh, I'm a bit wary of this. Oh, it has done something. Right, that is, it's downloaded me a font, which in theory is the same one as I had here. Oh, it's not quite the right one. Uh, let's, let's try again. Let's uh, reboot the server. Sorry, this was the most risky bit. So let's get the port 8888. Oh, I remember what I need to do. I need to do it. I also implemented, um, you know how Google fonts, you can um, set a text parameter that subsets the font at the same time. So I thought I'd do that as well. So text equals A, B, C, D, E, F, typo. Uh, Hmm, that's, did that not work? Let's try it one more time. Text equals ABC. Hmm. Sorry about that. It was working earlier. But the, uh, what's happening is the server is generating exactly the same font as you see there. And 
it's arriving in my downloads. And the implications of that um, relate to what I want to do with this button in the middle here. And that is a way of saving your current layout as HTML and CSS. So you get a download that works in variable browsers with variable fonts, and in static browsers, it goes to the Access Practice server or whatever server you have set up and generates those instances on demand. And the end result in the browsers is identical. Um, so I think that's it. Let's see what. So, yeah, we've got this. What I'm doing there is deciding do I want to render in the browser with JavaScript or on the. So, I, yeah, I have many choices. I can get. I can render in the browser with JavaScript if the browser doesn't handle variable fonts. I can render in the browser natively, which would be much quicker and more efficient if the browser does handle variable fonts. I can go back to the web font server and render, might get my instances done anyway, with exactly the same code as I was, as was, I was, I was just showing you in the browser. Um, so that's it. I hope you like the demo, and I hope you play with it and uh, give me lots of um, feedback. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure doing this. So I think you'll see lots more stuff. Yeah. <laughs>